I have here three generations of Mercedes-Benz diesel, the last three generations of Mercedes-Benz diesel. But it's not so much the cars themselves. This video is about the engines. More specifically, the last three diesel engines that Mercedes-Benz has ever produced. And when I mean last, I mean it. Sadly, Mercedes stopped making diesel engines in 2017, at least for the US market. So what we have here is the last of the Mercedes-Benz diesels. More specifically, the OM648, OM642, and OM651 over here on the GLK. I'm gonna be going through the uh, quirks, reliability, value of these engines, and uh, just seeing how they hold up after time. I mean, this OM648 over here is almost 20 years old. Now, when people think Mercedes diesel, they think 80s and 90s era, maybe early 2000s with the CDIs here. When people think of the reliability of Mercedes diesels, these are the areas they think of. I'm gonna get a little bit more into depth on the reliability of these newer vehicles, uh, because we do have the emissions equipment uh, on these vehicles that do make them less reliable than the older diesels. I'll get into that, however, because there are advantages to these newer engines, emissions equipment aside, uh, that does give them an advantage over the older cars. Now we're gonna start with the OM648 here, which is the oldest of these three engines. Now I call this old, but this is by, by modern standards, this is a modern diesel engine. All three of these engines are all common rail, direct injection, turbocharged diesels. They're all powerhouses and they're all fuel efficient. This OM648 being the oldest of them is, I would say, especially it's, it stood the test of time, it's the most reliable of all three of these cars. Now when I say this is the most reliable engine, that doesn't mean that these other two engines are unreliable, but I'll get more into those later. Pay no attention to the hickory nuts. There's some mice I've been trying to track down as this vehicle does sit outside. Getting into the specifics of this engine, I've done a lot of videos on this particular engine and the, the quirks about it. I, as well as uh, many others, believe this engine right here to be the single most reliable diesel engine that Mercedes has ever made. It surpasses the old OM617s, uh, the OM602s, all of them. It doesn't have any of the emissions equipment that the newer diesels have. It doesn't suffer from any of the head gasket or timing chain issues that the older diesels suffered from. And you have all the benefits of a modern, super responsive variable vane turbo, common rail direct injection. This thing is an absolute powerhouse. It is really easy to work on. All the parts are relatively cheap for it. This engine in particular has 508,000 miles on it. Now, a couple quirks that are not so much specific to the engine, but the chassis that this engine was put into. This engine was only used in the 2005 to 2006 E-classes. Because of that, when you do buy these cars, you have the SBC braking system over here. This was a really expensive uh, development by Mercedes-Benz. It is essentially brake by wire. It is expensive to repair if they ever go bad. However, they've been under warranty from Mercedes for like, what, 20 years? But for people looking to own these cars in the future, that SBC system will be one thing to consider going forward, especially after it goes out of warranty with Mercedes-Benz. The fuel pumps themselves can go bad. I actually replaced this probably like six years ago. Um, I think it was around 600 bucks or so, six to 800 bucks is the normal cost to replace those. They typically, however, do not go bad. Uh, I think the only reason mine went bad was just because of the number of miles on this engine. So anything under, you know, two, 300,000 miles, I don't think you're going to have any issues with the fuel pump itself. The emission system on this car, I've had zero issues with. I, I had to replace an oxygen sensor once. Uh, the EGR has given me no troubles at all. I know some people say those can be problematic, but I've owned this car for almost 10 years and never had a single issue with it. I'll sum it up on these OM 648s. I have worked on and owned every single Mercedes diesel engine from 1983 till 2013, which was when that GLK was built. I've owned and worked on every single one of them. And this OM 648 is, in my opinion, as I've said, the most reliable diesel engine that Mercedes Benz has ever made. Now we're gonna move up a few years from 2005 to 2007. Uh, this is an E-Class as well, same chassis W211 as my 2005 here, um, but this one has the OM642. The OM642 is a 3-liter V6. It's the only V diesel engine that Mercedes-Benz ever made, or I should say released in the North American market. This engine has, uh, with all respects and purposes, the same exact turbocharger that the OM648 had. Uh, the only difference is the location. It's mounted in the top of the V right there underneath that heat shield. Now, these engines, 
as far as the engines themselves, the, the you know the mechanicals of the engine, this is a very reliable engine. These things on sprinters, there's sprinters out there now with over a million miles with this engine, with the original engine. However, there are a few externals to the engine where this engine does have a few problems. Number one being, and this is the most expensive repair known on these engines other than the DPFs, uh, the oil cooler seals. The oil cooler itself, it's a large rectangular heat exchanger and it sits all the way at the bottom of the V. Now I made a video complete, like start to finish on how to do the oil cooler seals job on this engine. It is not easy and it is very time consuming. Several days of your time, this thing's gonna be parked. Um, the parts themselves to do this is only a couple hundred bucks. It's not expensive. So if you're a adventurous DIYer and you want to dig into one of these things that has the oil cooler seal issue, um, you know, feel free to. These cars are relatively cheap now. And as long as you go step by step, you follow my guide, you know, you pay attention when you're doing it, that job is absolutely doable. Uh, second largest problem on these engines, and it also has to do with oil, not the oil cooler, but right down here, there is a silicone seal that goes between this air intake plenum here and the turbocharger. Reason why this is a problem is because the crankcase vent valve right there vents oil as well as oil vapor through this tube and into the air intake before it goes into the turbo. When that silicone seal goes bad down there, uh, it drips oil down below this intake plenum and directly onto the swirl flap motors. Reason why that's a problem is because the oil dripping onto that motor, it's an electric servo motor, will cause that motor to fail and it is not fun to get that motor out. Um, however, there is an easy solution to that um, and it's what I've done right here. You can see this taped off plug right here. There is a resistor mod for just a couple cents. You can take a resistor and shove it inside of this plug right here between two pins and it essentially fools the computer into thinking that the servo is working and permanently disables the servo. Uh, the swirl flaps really don't do a whole lot. I've tried it both enabled and disabled and haven't noticed any different, either cold or hot in the performance of the engine. All right, now these Ohm 642s were used between 2007 and they're still, I believe, used today in sprinters, like in brand new sprinters. I don't think they've retired this engine yet. Smaller passenger vehicles, they've moved to the uh, inline four, like what's in that GLK over there. But reason I bring that up is because depending on the year of OM642 that you have and the vehicle that it's installed in, uh, you may or may not have the AdBlue system, which is the urea injection system. Uh, it adds a whole nother level of complexity to these engines. I mean, I believe 2009 and up is when they added that system. This 2007 does not have it. What it does have, however, is it has the DPF system in it. What the DPF does is it essentially catches all of the particulate. It's a diesel particulate filter catches all of that particulate and unburned fuel, stores it for a certain period of time, and then the car goes through what's called a regeneration. What happens during this process is the engine intentionally runs hot, the computer adjusts the amount of injected fuel and increases the exhaust temperatures to burn off all of the crap in the DPF. As a result of this, every single time one of these regenerations happens, the fuel economy of the vehicle absolutely tanks. Um, now, I'm not talking single digits here. Most of the time you're not really able to sense it. It just, it's an overall, as you're driving through a whole tank of fuel, it's an overall reduction in fuel economy versus the older diesels, regardless of the fact that this engine is more efficient. People that have deleted the DPF system and tuned these engines, which you can do, that is an option, uh, technically illegal to remove the DPF, but whatever. People that have done that mod have said that this engine does get much better fuel economy. The DPFs, however, if this engine is not run correctly, not driven correctly, uh, especially people do a lot of city driving, um, it can happen where those DPFs will get excessively clogged. And then when they try to do a burn off, it'll cause hot spots in the DPF and burn out some of the catalyst that's in there. I've never had to do it myself, but from what I've been told, it's several thousand dollars to replace these. It's actually cheaper to get the DPF deleted. Retune the engine is cheaper than just replacing the DPF. Now that's an extreme example. That's not gonna happen to anybody that's got a DPF issue or a DPF code. The majority of the time, especially on commercial diesels with DPFs, uh, they just remove the DPF and they essentially wash them out. They use a pressure washer and some degreaser and they just wash the thing out and put it back on and nine times out of 10, that'll do the job. 
But in addition to that, you have a couple extra oxygen sensors that are used on these things, as well as exhaust gas temperature sensors. There's just a ton of sensors downstream from the exhaust manifolds that are used on these engines um, that do cost money to replace, but they're not too terrible. Usually they're 100, 150 bucks or less uh, for these sensors. And I've had this car for, God, like six, seven years, I think, something like that. Um, I've only ever had one of those sensors go bad, and it was the exhaust gas temperature sensor. It was cheap enough that I don't even remember what it cost to fix it. <laughs> now, as long as you've got an OM642 that's pre-2009, this is pretty much where the major issues with these engines stop. As long as you keep up with regular maintenance, you change the oil, you change the air filters, you change the fuel filter, you change all the little things with these engines, just regular maintenance. That's pretty much where the reliability issues with this engine ends. But that's pretty much it for the OM642. Uh, as far as ease of working on these engines, being that they're a V6, they're a little bit harder to work on than the inline six. Uh, you know, some of the stuff you got to get to is deeper into the engine, deeper into the V. Um, you got to remove the air filter boxes and everything in order to get the injectors out, glow plugs. Interestingly enough, this being a newer engine than the inline six over here, this engine has a dipstick for the engine. The older 2005 does not. That is electronic only dipstick. Now we're gonna move on from 2007 to 2013. As far as personal experience, I have virtually none on these engines. This is the OM651. Uh, it's a 2.1 liter inline four. Now I said I don't have any personal experience with this engine, but I have done a lot of research into the reputation of this engine. This engine was used in the GLK. It was used in the MLs after 2016. The GLEs, I think they're called now. Uh, it was used in the E-Class. It was used in a broad variety of platforms, as well as the Sprinter. This engine was used in the Sprinter as well. I've talked to a lot of the Sprinter guys with this engine, as well as, you know, search the internet for anything I can about this engine. I found very little. This engine, for people that have used it, has been pretty damn reliable. The only issues with the engine is actually external of the engine. It's the emission system on these cars that is the most troublesome. Now, it's they're not as troublesome as the older DPFs. When Mercedes started putting the newer emission systems in, the DPF, the AdBlue system, uh, they were considerably more unreliable when they were first added. This being a 2013, Mercedes worked out the majority of the emissions issues with these vehicles. Right after the turbo, you've got the DPF, and it's the same general DPF as what they put on these older diesels as well. You have numerous sensors before and after the DPF to make sure that the engine is burning efficiently, to make sure that it's capturing all of that uh, particulate that's getting out of the engine, uh, and to make sure that the temperatures reached in the burn-off process is correct. Now, what this car has that that one does not, it has what's called the SCR catalyst. The DPFs and the AdBlue system on these vehicles, they can go bad, but the majority of the time, just like newer trucks, uh, if the DPF gets clogged up, you just remove it and clean it out. Now, the AdBlue system is definitely more of a complexity than DPFs are. And at least with Mercedes, the majority of those gripes came with the early AdBlue systems that were used on the OM642 in 2009 and 2010. The parts to replace on those systems were considerably more expensive. The urea heaters and the pump and the tank for those older units were all one part. Uh, they cost several thousand to replace. Just the part itself was over a grand. Now with this GLK at least, the newer AdBlue systems, the AdBlue pump, the AdBlue heater, and the injector are all separate units and they're all replaceable. And funny enough, there's actually aftermarket options out there for them. You don't have to buy OEM Mercedes for these parts. The injector is less than 200 bucks. The heater can run anywhere from 500 to around 190 from what I've seen if you decide to go aftermarket. The pumps, genuine Bosch, are I think 290. So even if you had to replace all of that stuff, it's not too bad. Now, what can be costly is the SCR catalyst. It's, think of it as like a catalytic converter for diesels. That, if you want to replace it from what I've seen, is like $1,800. Uh, and I don't see myself ever replacing that. If I actually need to, I'll probably go the route of, uh, of just deleting all the emissions equipment and installing a tune. Now, keep in mind, deleting all of the emissions equipment is illegal. It's especially illegal in states where you have vehicle inspections and emissions testing. I don't have that where I'm at, so, you know, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it, if we ever get to it. 
Uh, good news is, is that at least for the GLKs, I'm not sure about the other chassis where this engine was used, but there was a 10 year warranty on all of the emissions equipment. And this 2013, back in 2021, had all of the emissions equipment replaced. It had the DPF replaced, the uh, all of the AdBlue systems, the SCR catalyst, all of that stuff was replaced new less than three years ago at this point. And it's technically still under warranty for another two years. So that is as far as, you know, the, the major issue with reliability on these engines is going to be the emissions equipment. If you have that equipment deleted, I would venture to say that this engine would probably be the best value and the most reliable of any of the engines here. That being said, there are a couple other issues with this engine. I wouldn't say hardcore mechanical issues at all, uh, just little things here and there. The water pump on this vehicle, uh, strangely enough from what I've been told, is a vacuum controlled water pump. I've heard that these vacuum controlled water pumps can be an issue. Now, as far as power goes, this engine, as I said, is a 2.1 liter inline four. What's incredible is that this engine has the exact same power figures, 201 horsepower, 369 foot-pounds of torque, as the OM648 does, which is a 3.2 liter inline six. I find that pretty amazing. Um, a couple other things that are a little more unique to the chassis rather than the engine. Uh, this vehicle does not have a power steering pump. Uh, probably hard to tell here, but where the power steering pump typically goes, there's just an idler pulley back there. This car has electric steering, and from what I can tell, it's not an uh, electric hydraulic pump driving the steering. It's a servo motor or something. There is no power steering reservoir on this car anywhere. As far as I know, that electric steering system has not been an issue. It's not even widely known out there that these things have electric steering. So as far as I can tell, I mean, these vehicles are over 10 years old now. Uh, as far as I can tell, those are not much of an issue, especially considering like these MLs over here, those MLs are notorious for having leaky power steering pumps and steering racks. Now I've talked about the power figures of this engine, but the main appeal of this engine is the fuel economy. This GLK, which is a SUV, it's I guess considered a crossover, but it's not small. It weighs about 4,500 pounds and this thing combined city highway driving gets better fuel economy than either of these two cars. Even my 648 over there, which does not have any of the emissions equipment that this thing does. And this thing gets better fuel economy. Highway fuel economy, not as good, I would say, but that's not because of the engine. That's just because of the profile of an SUV. SUVs push more air. The drag coefficient is not as good as what cars are. Um, and so this same exact engine in the E-Class, I believe, if I remember correctly, returns like 44 highway. The EPA rating is 44 highway. That's pretty impressive. Uh, driving on the highway in the winter time, I got 34 MPG with this thing. In the summertime, those numbers are only gonna go up as the air gets less dense, so. Now on this OM651, you know, the jury is still out there on, on any deeper mechanical issues that may arise with these things as they get older. However, it's been about 10 years and these things are pretty trouble free. The value on these newer diesels are holding really well, especially when compared to their gasoline alternatives. As far as which one of these engines is the best, I think that entirely depends on what you plan on doing with these cars, the features of the chassis that they're installed in. The OM648, I would consider to be, as I've already said, the most reliable of all the bunch here. Uh, it sounds the best. The car is a ton of fun to drive. It's got a ton of power. It doesn't have any of the emissions issues as these vehicles do whatsoever. If you're looking for a daily driver, you just want a sedan, you know, it's rear wheel drive, you're not gonna get an all wheel drive version of this car. That is, in my opinion, the best diesel car that Mercedes has ever made. I would take the OM648 over the OM642 any day of the week. Now, where that opinion changes is whether you want all wheel drive or not, whether you want maybe an SUV. The problem is that OM648 was only put in that chassis. 2005, and then I also have a 2006 over here as well. Both of those cars are essentially exactly the same. The only difference is the model year. If you want an SUV, I, I would go so far as to say the OM651 is the engine you wanna go for. Reason being the fuel economy, the power delivery, and then all of the emissions equipment is a little bit more sorted out on the newer vehicles than it is on the older vehicles. 
And that about wraps it up for this video. This wasn't a very technical video. I just gave my thoughts and, and experience on you know, which one of these engines is better, their quirks and issues. Going forward, the vast majority of content on this channel is gonna be dedicated to this engine. Now, how often I put out content on this engine is entirely dependent on how unreliable it is. <laughs> if this thing tends to be incredibly reliable going forward, then, then you may not see videos from me very often on these things. Uh, I'm going to cover every single issue I have with these things. I'm not going to do videos on like oil changes and stuff like that. The oil change procedure on this engine is exactly the same as on any other, you know, modern Benz. But if I ever need to change an injector, if I have any emission system equipment issues, I'll be filming start to finish on all of those things. Because as I've said earlier, there is not a lot of information out there on these engines. And that was the exact same thing that I ran into 10 years ago with that OM648. I was one of the first people that uh, decided to DIY into those engines, documented the whole process on it. And I have a feeling that from my experience with that engine, that this OM651 will end up being the exact same story. Uh, next video that's gonna be coming out on this thing, I already have planned, uh, I'm gonna be doing a once over on pretty much everything. I'm gonna be doing an oil change on it. Again, like I said, I'm not gonna show that on camera. Um, but I'm going to do a transmission fluid flush. I'm going to drain and replace the oil in the transfer case. I'll probably do that to the diff as well. But that's it for this video. Till later.